Okay, so in this phase, what we're going to do is add a particular point at which we want these shells to be created. We call that a fire transform. And we call it that because it's just an empty game object that just has a transform component on it. And we put that in front of the barrel of the gun. Then we're going to use UI. We're going to use a slider yet again. We're going to sort of reappropriate it to create this effect. So we're going to put a canvas in front of our tank and we're going to use the slider as a thing that defines this arrow that shows you how much force you're putting into a shot. And it's going to vary, so depending on how long you hold down the shot, it's going to fire over different distances. First thing is to select our tank. And as we stated before, there's a number of different ways to do anything in Unity. Making a new object is and yet another one of those. So you can click on the Create menu on the hierarchy, you can click the Game Object menu, but if you want to do things directly and parent them at the same time, you can right-click on existing game objects. So I want to create a child object of the tank, so I right-click on my tank and I go to Create Empty. That places a new empty game object onto my tank. I'm just going to rename this Fire Transform. And then I'm going to give you a position and rotation to put it exactly in front of the gun barrel and then, you know, rotate it the right way. So the position for this is 0, 1.7, 1.35. And then the rotation is 350, 0, 0. Yeah, again, it's easier to see on the slides, so I'm just going to switch there. So position, 0, 1.7, 1.35. Rotation, 350, zero, zero. So just to unabstract that a little bit, the position of the fire transform, we don't want it to be left or right, so the, the X position is, of course, going to be zero because the, the barrel's in the middle of the tank. We want it to be up a little bit, so that's why it's 1.7 up in the Y axis. And we want it to be in front of the tank, not at the back or anywhere else, so that's why it's a little bit forward in the Z axis. So if you've done it right, it should look something like this just in front of it at the roughly the same angle as the artwork implies. And just forward so that we're not creating the shell so that it's going to intersect the collider and detonate straight away. That would be bad. As I said, this requires a little bit of UI work in order to get the arrow to show the player how much they're firing that shell by. So we're going to right click on our canvas now. So if you reselect the canvas that we've got on the tank and then right click, we're going to create a UI slider. So right click on the existing canvas. We don't want to make a new canvas. We can use the same one that we've got. We we'll create a UI slider. And we can rename this straight away to aim slider. So I'm just going to zoom out and show you what this looks like. Yet again, it's our old friend the slider not aware of what we want to do with it at all. We're going to basically make this a small strip that's going to exist in front of the tank. And we're going to hold down in order to increase the value on that slider and therefore increase the amount to which the arrow is shown. So what we want to do is alt click on aim slider on the arrow to expand everything. So remember when we did this on the canvas before, we alt click the arrow left of its name to expand everything at once. Then, as before, we need to get rid of the handle slide area because we don't want to be dragging this around. It's just based on the fire button in the game. So I'm going to select handle slide area and delete it, and therefore deleting the handle as well. So command backspace on Mac, delete on PC. And then we also don't need the background of this slider because we just want it to be invisible when they're not firing and then just emerge as soon as they start firing. So I'm going to select the background and delete it. So you should be left with aim slider, fill area, and fill. Quick reminder, so we right clicked on our canvas, that's our existing canvas that we used for the health slider, and we added a new object to it. So when you're working with the UI system, be aware that you invariably will just create one canvas and many things within it. So it's the same for screen space UI as it is with our world UI that we're doing. So then we've renamed it aim slider and we've expanded everything and removed the background and handle slide area game objects.
Then we need to make this not interactable. Yet again, it's something that's just controlled by a script. We're not going to be dragging on the screen with a mouse or anything like that. So I'm going to reselect my aim slider and look at the slider component in the inspector on the right. I'm going to uncheck interactable and because I don't want it to animate during any interaction, because we don't want any interaction, we set transition to none and that's going to remove all of those transition properties for you. Then finally, we're going to set this up based on the bottom being near the barrel of the tank and then the top being furthest away from the tank. So the direction, as we call it, we'll say is bottom to top. Then we're going to set the min and max values from 15 to 30. And we can leave our minimum value at 15. So we want it to start off and then draw this thing out to a certain amount. And you'll see that once we, once we start doing it. So we don't want it interactable. There's no transition. It needs to render from bottom to top once we've set up the position for it, which you'll see shortly and we have minimum and maximum values for that slider. Okay, so then, yet again, we need to set up this slider in context of its parent. So the parent of this slider is the canvas. Yet again, it's a quick way to get things roughly in the right size, is to just stretch them over their parent. Then you can start resizing them and stretching them to where you want them to be. So that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So what we're going to do is multi-select the aim slider and the fill area, just those two. Then if you look at the rec transform, yet again we have these anchor presets. So just to remind you, these are ways of stretching out where that UI element will exist. And also you can position them at the same time using Alt, which is exactly what we're going to do. So if we select that anchor presets and hold down Alt, you can see if I tap Alt now, we are stretching and positioning. So I'm going to right click the lower right stretch option there. And then what you'll see is it's getting roughly in the right place now. It's now based under our tank. Then I'm going to expand my fill area if I haven't already so I can see the fill. So with the fill selected, that's the image that we want to actually project. So we've made an arrow for you guys in Photoshop um, that's just got, kind of got a gradient fade to the bottom of it. And we've already sliced that up in the sprite editor in Unity. But just to show you that real quick, it looks like this. There's our aim arrow. And with the sprite editor, what you can do is basically define which areas are going to be sliced and stretched. So what you'll notice is that we've got this entire area at the top, which is fine. And then the outer area is defined as well. But in the middle, we've got this small space in which we can, we can stretch. That's already set up for you guys. You don't need to worry about that. I just wanted to show it to you. So with that fill game object, we're going to set up its visual area. So the first thing I'm going to do is to remove this value of 10 from the height. So I don't want it to be any distance from its parent at all. So I'm just going to just zero that out totally, set the height to zero. Then on the fill game object, there's also the actual image itself. So you'll see an image component. In source image, I'm going to choose that aim arrow. So click to the right of source image. Currently has this default UI sprite thing we don't want. Click on aim arrow there. So you won't be able to see anything just yet. We haven't quite finished it. Okay, so we've selected aim, slider, and fill area, and we've stretched them over the canvas, the parent. That's all we've done there. Remember, alt-click to stretch them out. And then we've expanded that fill area, um, selected the fill, and we've set the height to zero to remove any offset from the parent rect. So when I say the parent rect, I'm just referring to whatever's directly above it. So in this case, the fill area. And then on the fill game object, we've used circle select to choose the aim arrow. So we're going to go back to the aim slider right now. And what you should see is that if you select the rect tool, so the, the fifth one at the top here. So these tools, by the way, Q-W-E-R-T, if you're on a QWERTY keyboard, then that's how you can just switch between those tools. So the, the fifth one there is the tool you want. That will help you to see these dots and allow you to kind of drag things out. So what I'm going to do is just to uh, move my scene view around. So you can, of course, drag around with the first hand tool. But if you're on another tool, such as the rect tool, you can hold down Alt to orbit around what you're looking at. 
So if I alt and drag around, I can see what I'm doing. I'm just doing this to get myself some kind of overhead view. Another way to do that, of course, is to click on the Y spoke of the gizmo in the top right there, and then tap the center cube to change into a totally flat view overhead. Because what I'm trying to do is this, and I'll show you, I'll show you it quickly and then we'll go back through it. I'm gonna drag the outer bounds in so that they're roughly on the edge of the tank. I'm gonna drag it a little bit longer, and then I'm gonna drag it up so that it's snapped on the front of the tank. Something like that. Then I'm gonna orbit around, so I'm in orthographic sort of isometric view right now. And then I'm gonna drag with my translate tool, I'm gonna to drag back in the Z axis just to bring that up a little bit. So it's just slightly off the ground like that. So I'm gonna go back a few steps and just run, by, run that by you again. So once more, with my rep tool, I'm just dragging in the bounds. So remember we're on the aim slider. Make sure you've got the aim slider selected. Drag in the left and right edges. Make it a little bit taller. Drag it forward. This doesn't need to be precise, by the way. This will just be a, a design choice. So you might have a slightly more extended arrow than anyone else does on their tank. But as long as that slider is going between those two values, it will function the same as everybody else's game. And then all I've done to, to bring that up off the ground, because the uh, rec tool deals with 2D specifically, we have to jump back to the translate tool, drag the blue arrow backwards to bring it up off the ground. And you should end up with something that looks like this. Of course, save your scene throughout, just to make sure you're up to date. And if you do want the exact same values that, that we intend you to use, I'll give you those values now. So I've just done this by hand, but if you wanted to just type them into the inspector, our values would be one, minus nine, minus one, one, and three. Would look something like that. So remember this is the aim slider. One, minus nine, minus one, one, three. And as before, because it's a slider and the slider is controlling uh, how the image will behave, if I drag my value on the slider, you'll see that my arrow is doing what it should do. So you can test it out that way. Make sure you leave it back on the lowest possible value to the left with that slider once you've tested it out. Uh, we have our aim slider set up and we're ready to start actually firing shells, which is exactly what we need for this tank shooter. Otherwise, it will just be a tank. Something. OK, so in our scripts folder, if you pop that open, you'll find something called tank. We've been in there before. This time, we need tank shooting. And we're going to just drag and drop that onto the tank game object. So I can basically collapse my tank right now. Just click on the arrow next to its name. And then I'm going to drag tank shooting and drop it onto the tank. I'm just going to collapse my other components so that you can see it more easily now. So we have our tank shooting there and we're ready to start editing it. You'll see there's a number of different public variables which are ready to populate. But we'll talk about those in context of the script. That way when we come back and populate them, they have some meaning. So if you double click on tank shooting to open up that script, we are ready to edit. So like we've had before, there are some block comments that we need to get rid of before we can continue. Okay. Yeah, let's do the first. So on line 17 and line 37, there should be an, a, slash, a slash asterisk and an asterisk slash. Ooh, easy quite, to say. Yeah. Okay, so that's all the comments done. Let's go through those public variables and find out what they mean. So like we had with the tank movement script, we have a player number because we need some input in this class. So we need to know which input axis we need to reference. So in this case, it's going to be fire one for player one, fire two for player two, etc. So that's why we need that. We need a reference to the shell prefab that we're going to instantiate. So we've got that rigid body shell there. So remember, this isn't a reference to the rigid body. We can just because we only want to affect things about that rigid body, we can just refer to that as the prefab. OK, and we need a reference to that place that we're going to fire the shells from, that fire transform. So 
That's what that reference is there. Obviously, we need a reference to the slider to make it grow and shrink. We need a reference to the second audio source in the tank, the one that's going to play the sound effects for shooting. So that's what that audio source is there for. And we need to know what clips that audio source is going to play, so we need a reference to those two audio clips. One for charging up the shot, and one for actually firing it. And so now we've got a few float variables. We've got the minimum and maximum launch force. So do you remember the values of the slider we gave you were 15 for minimum, 30 for maximum? So that is going to correlate like we did with the health we did from 0 to 100 for health. We're doing 15 to 30 for the launch force. If you want to change the launch force, change them both here and on the slider. Don't recommend you do that because it starts bumping into things like the tank if you're going too fast, that sort of stuff. Let them discover it on their own. <laughs> you can try tweaking stuff. We won't be upset, but uh, yeah, we found these to be good values for now. Yeah. So the last public float is how long it's going to take to get from the minimum launch force to the maximum launch force. So about three quarters of a second to go from minimum charge, where you're just, just shooting the shells just about, to really firing them across the screen takes about three quarters of a second. Based on that time and how much charge we need to build up, we're going to calculate how fast that needs to go. And that's going to be called the charge speed, which is our third private variable down there. But the ones before that, if you remember, the input axes are strings, so input buttons are also strings. So we've got one for the fire button there, which we'll store based on the player number. And we need to keep track of how much we've charged up the shot so far, so that's the current launch force, how much have we built up so far. And the last one is whether or not we fired yet, because we don't want to fire multiple times, we want to do it once per button press. Cool. So the next function we've got there is on enable, so that's when the tank is turned back on after being killed. We're setting the current launch force back to the minimum, and we're setting the aim slider's value back to the minimum. So when you're alive, you're not already charging a shot, you just start again. Then we've got the start function. So again, this is called right at the start only once. On enable might be called multiple times if you die multiple times, but start will only be called once. So we're calculating the fire button, and that's equal to the string fire plus a number based on the player's number. So fire one for player one, fire two for player two, etc. Just a quick reminder. In the input settings, those are the things I was talking about earlier. So fire one there, we just take the player number, put it on the end, and that then references this, which gives us, in this instance, the space bar. So the last thing we're doing in start there is calculating the charge speed. So if you remember speed equals distance over time, this is the same thing. The distance that we've got to cover is from the minimum to the maximum launch force. And the time we've got to do that is the charge time. So speed is the distance we've got to cover over the time. That's how we're calculating that. So next, we've got the update function. Now the update, what it needs to do is take care of all the input. So when the button is being pressed for the first frame, when it's being held down, and when it's being released, it also needs to take care of the account when you've held it for too long and you've reached the maximum, and then you need to fire. So to do that, we're going to have a series of if-else statements to make sure we're catching all the cases. But the first thing we need to do is make sure that the aim slider's default value, so every frame we're going to set the default value of the aim slider back to the minimum launch force. So by default, the aim slider is invisible, it's at its most minimum value. And then if we decide that it needs to be at a different value, we can set it then. The first if statement we're going to write is if open parentheses m underscore current launch force is greater than or equal to max launch force so m underscore max launch force and so that's double ampersand we have not yet fired so exclamation mark m underscore fired so that's the case we have charged up to the maximum yet, and we've not yet fired, so we need to do something about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to write all of these if statements so we can take care of the cases and then come back at the end and go through what we actually need to do in those cases. So I'm just going to put in a single line comment just to remind you what you're doing. You can write that in or not. It's up to you. So at the maximum amount of charge, but not yet fired. So after that, 
we have an else if statement. So else space if open parentheses. And then in this case, we're dealing with when the button is first pressed. So when the button is first pressed, input dot get button down is returned true. So get button down is when it's first pressed. And the button that we want to check is the fire button. So M underscore fire button. Okay. And if we have not reached the maximum charge and we've not just pressed the button, then we might be holding the button. So the next else if statement is input dot get button. So that's saying, is the button currently held? But we need to check if it's currently held that we haven't fired already. Because we might have hit the maximum launch force and then not fired it. So we need to check for that. And the last else if statement is, you might have guessed it, if you've released the button. So in this case, it would be else if input dot get button up fire button. And again, we need to check that we've not yet fired. So you might have noticed that all of them are checking that we've not yet fired apart from when we first press the button. And that's because when we first press the button, of course, we haven't fired. We've just pressed the button. OK, so let's go back through those and think about what we actually need to do there. So in the first case, we've gone beyond the max charge and we've not yet fired. So what we really need to do is fire, but we don't want to do it beyond the maximum charge. We want to do it at the maximum. So what we'll do is we'll set the current launch force to the maximum launch force so that it's not over the top. And we'll call the fire function, which is a function we'll write in a little bit. Then if we've just pressed the button for the first time, then we know that we have not yet fired. So M underscore fired is false. We've not fired yet. And we also know if we just press the button that the launch force should be at its minimum. So we'll set current launch force equal to min launch force. Also, when we've just pressed the button, we want to start playing a sound effect that relates to it charging up. So what we do is set the shooting audio's clip to the charging clip. So m underscore shooting audio dot clip equals charging clip. And we'll play that audio clip. So m underscore shooting audio dot play. OK, so the next one is if the button is being held. So if the button's being held, we don't want to fire, but we do want to update how much the charge has gained. So what we're going to do is set the current launch force to itself plus charge speed times delta time. So to do that, we do plus equals charge speed times time dot delta time. So remember that plus equals, what it's doing is it's saying, add this to its current value. It's saying, set this to itself plus a little bit extra. And with that new current launch force that we've just increased, we'll set the aim sliders value to the current launch force. So similar to the health UI that we did before, we're effectively setting the value and then refreshing the actual visual element of it by setting the sliders value. OK. And the last case that we need to deal with is if you've released the button, you fire. That's it. So let's quickly go over that. First off, we're resetting the value to a default value. And then we'll only change the aim slider based on the button being held. Or pressed or released. Yes. If the current launch force is greater than the maximum, we'll set it back to the maximum and then fire based on that. If the button is being pressed for the first time, then we have not yet fired. So fired gets set to false. And the current launch force gets set back to a minimum. We also play the correct clip for that situation. If the button is being held and we've not yet fired, so that's get button for held, then we'll increase the launch force by the charge speed multiplied by time dot delta time. And we will set the aim sliders value appropriately. Finally, if we've released the button, then we'll fire. 
You don't need to set any other audio conditions. That's a good question. So the question, if you didn't hear, was why don't we set other audio conditions? So basically the way this works is we have an audio clip that's kind of incremental, kind of charging sound. And what happens with that is that when we write the fire function in a moment, we're going to play a different clip. So what we do is interrupt it effectively with the, sh the sound of it firing. So that's effectively cutting it off and replacing the clip with another, and that will take care of the, the rest of the audio in that scenario. That's a good question. Okay, so let's move on to the fire function. So what we need to do here is instantiate the shell and give it a velocity based on how much we've charged up. So the first thing, when we fired, of course, fired equals true. So that's gonna deal with all the, the logic above that we've just put in. And the next thing we need to do is actually instantiate a shell. So we're gonna use that instantiate function again, but we're going to use its return type. So we're going to say that a rigid body called shell instance is equal to instantiate. The thing that we're gonna instantiate is the shell. So M underscore shell. We're going to instantiate it at the fire transform's position. So M underscore fire transform dot position. And we're going to instantiate it at the fire transform's rotation as well. So it's M underscore fire transform dot rotation. So that's the last parameter that we've got there. But instantiate actually returns something just an object doesn't return a rigid body naturally. So in order to assign it a rigid body, what we do is we say as a rigid body at the end. And what that'll do is it'll say, okay, I've created an object. Can I treat this as a rigid body? Well, it's got a rigid body component. So yes, and I'll return that. So effectively this is doing two things at once. We're instantiating and we're placing the rigid body into the scene. And we're also assigning it to a variable that we can give a velocity. Okay, so let's do let's that. Do that. So shell instance is a rigid body, so it has a velocity. Now velocity has a type of vector three. So what we're gonna do is give it a direction, which is the fire transforms forward direction, and a magnitude, which is the current launch force. So we'll do M underscore current launch force multiplied by M underscore fire transform dot forward. So that, all that's saying is in the forward direction of the fire transform, with an amount equal to the current launch force. So that's launched the shell all successfully, but we do need to change the audio that's playing as we were just mentioning earlier. So shooting audio dot clip gets set to the fire clip and that will automatically stop the audio source from playing. So we need to play the audio source with the new clip. So M underscore shooting audio dot play. And the last thing we need to do, well, we don't need to, this is more of a safety catch is we're setting the current launch force equal to the min launch force. So that's just making sure that if some button press sneaks in there, then we're not going to launch it twice with maximum velocity or something. That is the bottom of that script. So do save, switch back to the editor, have a look at the console for any errors that you might have. Cool. OK, wonderful. Let's hope that I got it right. <laughs> Which I did. Okay, so reselect the tank and we need to populate this. So as many of you are probably discovering as you're running ahead and trying to press play and hoping to shoot things, it won't work just yet because we haven't assigned those public variables that we need to. So on tank shooting, we need to assign a few things. So our shell, you'll remember, is a prefab. So delve into the prefabs folder in the project, grab your shell prefab and drop it onto where it says none rigid body. I will assign it there. Then the fire transform is a child of the tank. If you expand the tank, you will find fire transform. You drag and drop that on. Likewise with the aim slider. The aim slider is the game object to assign there. And then shooting audio is the slightly trickier one. I'm grabbing the second audio source. So the title, make sure you collapse them. It's a lot easier to do. Grab the title of that component, drop it onto the variable shooting audio. So grab the component name, drop it on there. And the last two should be fairly self-explanatory. They're just two audio clips. Charging clip, use the circle select. Shot charging. You can use circle select whilst the window's still open to just switch to assigning something else. I'm just gonna select that and shot firing for the second one. 
So it should be assigned, it should look like that. Okay, so what I would like you to notice is that with the tank, we've added a few things to the tank since we last updated the prefab. And as we know, when we don't update a prefab, we have things that are in gray and not in blue to indicate that they're part of the prefab version that's saved in the project. So with the tank selected, I would like you to hit apply at the top of the inspector to update that prefab. It's very important that the version in the project is the finished version that we've made so far. So hit apply at the top of the inspector, then all of the child objects underneath that. So remember you can alt click the arrow to expand all. They should all be in blue right now. So apply with the tank selected. Okay, so the tank is now finished but we don't want it to stay in the scene. We do want to just make sure it works. So I'm just going to hit play. I'm just going to turn my volume down or off. Actually, no, I'm going to turn it on so you can see what it's meant to sound like. The keen eared among you will notice that the mix is terrible. and You can't really hear the charging, the shooting. We'll fix that at the end with audio mixing. So that's all going to sound great by the time we're finished. So don't worry about that. But for now, you should just be able to drive the tank around, charge up a shot or do small shots. Or you can do what Mike likes to refer to as Death Lotus, this move. But once you've done that, the tank is complete. Once you've hit apply, we're going to get rid of it out of the scene. It's finished. It's ready to be used by the game manager. So I'm going to select my tank. Make sure you've updated, saved your prefab. Command backspace to delete it or delete on PC. Save your scene once you've got rid of your tank.